This session is entitled Key Insights from Western and European Policy Towards Political Islam in Light of the Arab Spring. Um, we're going to be joined by Dr. Azam in a few minutes, um, and we have here John McHugo and Dr. Adib Ziade. So I'm going to start with, um, so John's going to go first. John McHugo is, uh, let me just turn to my page. John McHugo is the author of A Concise History of the Arabs and Syria from Great War to Civil War. He is a board member of CARBU and chair of the Liberal Democrat Friends of Palestine. He originally studied Arabic and conducted research into, edi into early medieval Sufi thought at Oxford and the American University in Thank you, Shazia. Can you all hear me? You can hear me at the back? Brilliant. Um, we're talking about European foreign policy reactions, I think, to the Arab Spring, but I'm not going to be sticking to that because it's not an area that I claim any expertise in. And when uh, Abdullah asked me if I'd be happy to speak, I said I would, but I'd probably say something a little different. And he said that would be fine. So but what I thought I'd do is I'd try and touch on something that we haven't actually touched on today, at least not in these, any of the sessions I've been in. And this is about why do religious people involve themselves in politics? And what are they trying to achieve? And as with, and I'm, I'm a non-Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm, a, I'm British, I am a European, so I'm looking at it from an outside perspective when it comes to the world of Islam and the politics of the movement we now call Islamism, which, as we all agree, is extremely diverse. And I think there are really three reasons people who are religious go into politics or fight for, polit for politics. The first concerns values, things such as the need for accountability, honesty and transparency, social justice, freedom, law and order. Um, and also, let's also mention something else, the concept of the common good. And these are things that I think Christians and Muslims and people of all faiths, and of no faiths at all for that matter, share. And so I think it is absolutely right that everyone should be fighting for these rights together. Also, in um, sometimes religious people will go into politics because they want to preserve traditions and customs. And I think the third, um, and that I think is understandable, and the third is what we, what we might call identity politics, when the politics of your religion is tied up very much with your identity. And here I'm thinking primarily of nationalism. And as I said, I'm th talking from a European perspective, so let's have some European examples of this. When you think of the way that Poland suffered under the Nazis and under the communists, and you see the history of Poland since then, I think there's no doubt that the Polish religion of the overwhelming majority of people which happened to be Catholicism, helped them get through very difficult times. And so it wouldn't be at all surprising if in Arab countries today, where the entire population or the bulk of it is Muslim, if Islam is playing a similar role. Um, other ex but also, of course, once you're talking about identities, this does become a little problematic sometimes. I mean, another Catholic people in Europe are the Basques, and they have their nationalist movements. But it was only in about 1970, I think, that Basque nationalists accepted that, in theory, it was possible for a Basque to be a Basque who wasn't also a Catholic. And then, of course, we think of the politics of Ireland, where, of course, religion has been a very important marker of identity. In the 20th century, Irish nationalism has been very much associated with Catholicism, although, of course, we're talking about a secular nationalism, ultimately. But nevertheless, it's quite interesting. If you go back to the 19th century, you find the religious roots were much less strong. And let's also point out that in the 19th century, um, we talk about political Islam today in the sense of people who want to set up an Islamic state. But there were things a little bit like this in the Christian West. When Europe 
when in the great wave of nationalism in um, uh, in in Italy, when the Italian people were trying to unify themselves, there was the suggestion that the Pope should be made the head of state, and it was something that was taken quite seriously. And later on in the century, you have the Emperor Napoleon III of France um, trying to set up a specifically Catholic empire in Mexico. Now, I believe that kind of thing is wrong today, just as it was wrong then. And I agree with the Sudanese scholar, turning now to Islam, <coughs> Abdullahi ibn Naim, that the idea of an Islamic state is a dangerous delusion. And he maintains that throughout the history of Islam, Islam and the state have normally been separate. Now, I know that um, goes against the views that many people will have, and I, they are his views, and I just throw them open for discussion. Um, one may, might mention um, at the same time that the Ottoman Caliphate, in the view of many scholars, such as the Iraqi scholar um, Ali Alawi, Ali Alawi um, the, the true caliphate in the sense of a caliphate that could have a reasonable claim to allegiance from all Muslims ended with the Abbasids in 1258. So the idea of restoring a caliphate in a political sense today, I think, is um, frankly something that should be fading into the past. But I'd like to talk, turn to someone who's my great hero, and that's Rashid Ghanoushi in Tunisia. And he has given a lot of thought, and I have here on my right the man who has written his biography. Um, Renouchi has given a lot of thought as to what the ro role of religion in politics should be. And it is to provide us with a system of values and principles that will guide our thinking, behaviour and the regulations of the state to which we aspire. He is against taking religion out of the public sphere altogether. Because, he said, if you do that, you risk dictatorship. He likes the idea of a transcendent set of values, and I agree with him. And again, what uh, Renouchi says there, I think, could, comply, could apply equally to Christianity and other faiths, as well as to Islam. And as um, Azam Tamimi puts it very well in his biography of Rashid Renouchi, where he says that Islam's contribu contribution to democracy would be a transcendent morality that seems to have no place in today's democratic practice. What Islam provides is not only a set of values for self-discipline and for the refinement of human conduct, but also a set of restrictions to combat monopoly and a set of safeguards to protect public opinion. And let's not forget that Western democracy is far from perfect. We have things like the influence of big money, the influence of newspaper proprietors, and so on. And maybe there is something here, I think these are points Renouchi has made, and I think we should listen to him. A good deal of Christian political thought, incidentally, has gone into the European Union. The idea of the common good, ideas such as solidarity and subsidiarity, uh, come from uh, specifically Christian social teaching. And it interests me very much that there is this Christian idea of the common good, because it seems to me you have exactly the same idea in Islam, where it is called al-maslaha al-arma. You have, going back, to the, you know, going back to the Hanbali law school in the Middle Ages, you have the idea of the principle of maslaha, the sharia should be interpreted for the benefit of humanity. And what I'm really saying is I think Islam, like other faiths, has a very good contribution to make to politics. And I hope, and I'm a member of a political party myself, as are many other people here today, some from other political parties. And um, I'm not saying belong to my party or to anyone else's, but I think it would be great if people involved themselves more in party politics. And I think it would be wonderful if the Muslim community did more of those. Sorry, did more of that. Now, I've given a framework. As I said, I think there are good reasons for going into politics if, you're a religion, if you are religious. You want to uphold values, and also you may want it to reflect your identity. And these are praiseworthy things. And I think um, we should all thank the Cordoba Foundation for arranging this conference, which I think is very timely and very interesting. 
but I hope I've added something a little bit different to the debate. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I spoke in the morning, so probably I need not really speak again. But some of the um, interesting uh, points you raised, John, uh, uh, just enticed me to <laughs> to uh, uh, raise some um, some points. Um, Rashid Ganushi also uh, discussed the concept of secularism in civil society and. Uh, uh, tried to contrast the Western experience with the Muslim experience. Um, and I think this is an issue that, uh, although it has been uh, written about uh, and has been discussed and many PhDs have been uh, done um, uh, uh, on it, and we have some great scholars like uh, Professor, the late Professor Abdul Wahab al-Misiri who wrote a lot on this, uh, they are still not... Uh, uh, not not clear enough, not acceptable yet, uh, to a degree that they um, resolve the dispute between the two contrasting viewpoints. Uh, the, may, the, the the thing is that the Western experience with religion uh, is not the same as the Islamic experience with religion. Um, people, Muslim people, when they practice politics, they don't practice politics as people of religion or as religious people. They don't see themselves as such. They see themselves as individual members of the community who observe uh, what they believe of religious values. Um, actually, to, to, uh, to an extent, uh, what happened in the Muslim lands is opposite of what happened in the uh, in in Europe uh, much earlier, uh, in the sense that uh, the emergence of the modern state in the Arab world uh, led to the monopolization of religion and the use of religion by the powers that came to be. Uh, even secular uh, leaders like uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser or uh, even Bashar al -Assad, uh, sorry Hafez al Assad uh, for him. Uh, so all these uh, uh, military officers and also the royal dynasties that rule some of the Arab countries, like in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, actually they use religion in order to legitimize sometimes uh, going against religion itself or against religious values themselves. So rather than uh, having a secularization process that led to emancipation, to liberalization, both political as well as economic. Uh, we had actually a form of secularism that emerged in the Muslim lands that uses religion in order to suppress the population uh, and uh, muzzle uh, free speech. Uh, for instance, in, uh, such a, a great institution like Al-Azhar. Uh, for, for the past hundred years or so, Al-Azhar has been, has been a state entity used by the state authorities. Uh, the Hayat Kibar al-Ulama in Saudi Arabia, a state institution whose uh, job is to issue fatwas upon demand. Uh, so if you want to legitimize inviting the American troops to Arabia, you have a fatwa. If you want to ban women from driving cars, you have a fatwa. Nothing to do with uh, necessarily the values of religion or even tradition, but rather it's, uh, relig uh, these institutions have become a tool in the hands of secular entities. Saudi Arabia is not really a religious uh, or a theocratic uh, 
sort of regime. It's a secular regime in every sense, but it is using uh, uh, the religious establishment in order to legitimize uh, itself uh, and legitimize its uh, policies. Now, what Islamic movements, uh, what, what is usually referred to as political Islam nowadays, although I don't like the, uh, the terminology, what they are trying to do is actually emancipate society from all such restrictions. Uh, yes, we are Muslims, we are proud of our uh, uh, religion. Uh, five minutes more to go? That's a lot of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we want uh, to live as free individuals, we want to establish proper, uh, uh, or we want to establish good governance. Uh, we believe we have uh, principles, we have literature, but we don't have uh, the expertise. That's why Rashid Ganushi always believed that we cannot start from zero. We have to start from the uh, great achievements of liberal democracy. Uh, because if, if we consider democracy to be at least partly a set of procedures, we need to begin with those set of procedures and probably as we go on establish some sort of a marriage between Islamic values and procedural democracy. Uh, because we, we, we will continue to have some problems with liberalism as an ideology or with secularism as a world view. Uh, so it's not uh, religious, religious people entering into politics. It's rather uh, an activity in which Muslims engage in the, as individuals and as groups. And this is the essence of what Hassan al-Banna tried to do. When Hassan al-Banna uh, at a very young age, in his uh, early 20s, uh, saw what was wrong with uh, Egypt and with its uh, surroundings, decided to bring together a number of his uh, mates and uh, to discuss how to go about this. The objective is not to establish a theocracy, because those who understand Islamic history and Islamic uh, uh, doctrine, there's no such thing as a theocracy in Islam, because uh, the Islam, after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, does not, uh, does not uh, endow uh, uh, infallibility on any human institution or any human individual. So all human beings are fallible, and that's why we have the concept of ijtihad, which means you endeavor, <coughs> you try, you think, you can be right or you can be wrong. But to encourage you to exercise that ijtihad, even if you get it wrong, you, you will be rewarded. So that people continue to think and continue to reflect this is what jihad is, uh, ijtihad is about. Um, uh, so people who have proper knowledge of Islamic doctrine as well as the early years of Islamic governance during the time of the Prophet and the rightly guided Caliphate, it's far from a theocracy. It was, the, the, the principle is the same as we study uh, in uh, democratic theory, uh, that uh, it is the ummah, it is the community, it is the nation, call it whatever you like to call, that, that decides who rules and who brings eventually the ruler to account uh, and decides whenever it uh, feels uh, uh, or it deems uh, appropriate to change uh, such uh, a ruler. So I think this problem, this uh, misunderstanding between uh, certain strands within the Muslim world and certain strands within the Western world, although actually it's it's really no longer possible to divide the world in, in such a way, Muslim and Western. <laughs> uh, it's, we, we've become just a, a very small village. But this sort of misunderstanding as to, how, as, as to what Islam means, Islam is not, uh, Islam had, it's, it is a religion, of course, uh, Christianity is a religion, like Judaism is a religion, but it had a, different, a, dif a completely different course. And from, it, from inception, Islam established the rule of the Ummah and the, and, and the Ummah as the source of legitimacy rather than uh, anything else. And I, I hope that uh, through interaction and uh, through uh, more discussions about this, we will be able to clear, to clear uh, this away. And that's why in my, in my uh, uh, book about Ganushi, which was my PhD th uh, uh, dissertation, uh, I argued that one of the main obstacles to democratization in the Arab world today, actually I talk about five major obstacles, but one of the main obstacles is the concept of secularism as uh, uh, practiced and implemented in the Arab world since the days of colonialism. Well, thank you very much.
Alex recall Dr. Adib Ziadeh to speak. Dr. Adib Ziadeh is an Associate Fellow of the Higher Education Council in the UK. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk about the EU reaction to the military coup against the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and I would like to test the Europeans' credibility uh, in this uh, issue. Uh, I'll uh, talk about my aim of this uh, presentation. I'll uh, talk about the uh, inspiring um, EFSP values, European foreign sec and security policy values, the underpinning values. And I'm talking uh, about three trials and one policy, reactive policy of the EU. I'll uh, give some uh, examples about the paradoxes in this uh, regard about Egypt, Gaza, and how the EU reacted uh, against both uh, cases. I'll shed some light on the uh, China-Egypt uh, paradox and the Ukraine and Russia-Egypt third paradox. I'll, uh, if there is still uh, some time, I'll talk about the determinants of the EU policy and to conclude about this matter. The aim of my presentation is to show how inconsistent and incredible, hypocritical, the EU is with regard to its foreign policy toward the military coup against Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Uh, inconsistency in this regard means the gap between the theoretically uh, based values and how these values when uh, we try to practice on the ground, the gap between the practice and the theory. And how policies are different in uh, under the same circumstances in Egypt and other places. This is what I mean in, about inconsistency. Why it is important? There is a lot of debate about the European or the Western uh, reaction and its uh, role played in sustaining or uh, supporting extremism in the Arab world the last of which was uh, delivered by ex-prime minister, form, former French prime minister. Uh, I think that most of you heard about him, what he said that when he, hold, when he held a Western foreign policy responsible for the multiplication of terrorism hotspots around the world, speaking to the France TV, he said that ISIS is a deformed child of arrogant Western policy. So if we uh, want to know and how to understand uh, uh, why we are talking about the reaction of the EU, we want to address how this issue is important with regard to supporting extremism in the Arab world and the same, at the same time maybe repressing uh, and uh, suppressing uh, the modernism uh, in this world. Uh, first of all, norms inspiring the EU from policy as underpinned in its uh, uh, maybe treaties and agreements, uh, you know that we have uh, many values. It is written here, the union's action on the international scene shall be guided as enshrined the entreaty, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, by the principles which have inspired its own creation, development and enlargement and which it seeks to advance in the wider world. They are democracy, rule of law, human rights, fundamental freedoms, respect of human dignity, the principles of equality and solidarity, the United Nations character, international law. All these values are the underpinning values of its policy outside of Europe. And these uh, uh, values are um, enshrined in all association agreements between the EU and the other party. So we are talking about the EU-Egyptian association agreement. Those values are underpinning this uh, association agreement. 
So if we want to uh, judge this policy, this foreign policy of the EU, we have to look at these principles and uh, how these principles applied when they practiced politics outside of Europe. Uh, we have here three trials while we have one EU reaction. The first one in 1992, when Islamic Salvation Front in Algeria won the elections. The uh, EU reaction at that time was the same reaction as it, is, as, as it is now in Egypt, and the same as it was in uh, its reaction toward what happened in Gaza. In 1992, the European uh, policy at that time supported the military coup against democratization, against the victory of uh, uh, the Islamic Salvation Front, while in 2006, when Hamas won the elections, the democratically held elections in Palestine, as well, the EU uh, neglected these uh, results, and not just, not only uh, neglected these uh, elections, but incited against this democracy. And I have, because I, I, I made my, my, uh, my PhD, on the EU foreign policy toward Hamas uh, government and movement in Palestine, I have many, many declarations, many uh, maybe press releases and many declarations from which you understand that the EU from the beginning incited Mahmoud Abbas and um, the government in Ramallah to act, to act, maybe to uh, take over the situation which resulted out of, out of the elections in 2006. The third one is Muslim Brotherhood in 2013. Unfortunately, the same reaction of the EU happened again and again in 2013. After one day of the coup in 4th of uh, July 2013, the EU foreign policy determined uh, its position beside Sisi against Muslim Brotherhood. In these three cases, Islamists have had the legitimacy of the ballot books. In two of them, Islamists had only soft power. While, they, while in the Gaza Strip, in the Gaza case, they have had hard power alongside the soft power. In the first two cases, they were easily and overwhelmingly swallowed, while in the third case, they could survive so under siege. In the Egyptian and Algerian cases, Islamists' removal have been implicitly and explicitly accepted and supported, and none in the EU shed tears over their misery. While in the Hamas case, the democracy had to be seen failed from the beginning, it had brought, because it had brought Hamas to power. We agreed 14 minutes, yeah? Okay. <laughs> the first paradox, day after the coup in Egypt, uh, there was a declaration by the, uh, the EU, a statement by the High Representative Catherine Ashton. Uh, how did she react? How did she react? Uh, this is the declaration which she uh, mentioned. I'm following closely developments in Egypt and I'm fully aware of the deep divisions in this blah, blah, blah. I urge all sides to rapidly look and put to lines, red lines, I put here red lines under these uh, words, I urge all sides after one day of the coup, rapidly return to democratic process, including the holding of free and fair presidential and parliamentary, parliamentary elections and the approval of a constitution. Okay, okay, uh, Mrs. Catherine, what's about, what's about the presidential elections uh, and five, five elections held over two years in Egypt. What's about those elections? Immediately now, after one, just one day of the coup, now we want to start again and again another kind of elections. And what if Muslim Brotherhood, if supposedly uh, these elections uh, are held and supposedly Muslim Brotherhood are winning in these elections? And another revolution come, another uh, military coup come. What will you 
react in this case? Will you, will you uh, uh, maybe still in the same position, rapidly return to democratic process? Which process? Which democratic process? Can you please be more precise, holding free and fair presidential and parliamentary elections? Oh, okay. And she urged to respect for fundamental freedoms, rights, Look what happened when this issue, the same, happened in Gaza Strip. Now, so, so uh, just before, uh, in Gaza Strip, the council expressed, this is the, the declaration, and I want maybe from each of uh, us to uh, just to differentiate how, how the EU reacted in, the both, in both cases. The council expressed in its deep concern regarding the extremely serious events in Gaza and condemned in the strongest possible terms the violent coup perpetrated by Hamas militias. Why this language is lost when it comes to Egypt? Why this language, this strong and firm language, is lost when it comes to, the, uh, to victimizing Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt? Why? It's a very telling declaration how politics high hidden beside, beside this kind of language. Um, so they considered, they considered implicitly and explicitly, they considered the coup in, in Egypt as benign, benign coup, democratic coup, or revolutionary coup. So no sanction against those who committed this crime to the first fairly and f fair uh, elections done in Egypt. What would happen if the Muslim Brotherhood committed such a coup against secular parties under the same circumstances? What would be the reaction? I asked this question to uh, one of the uh, politicians here. He said it would have been maybe a disaster, a disaster reaction. The second paradox, when Rabia massacre happened in, uh, on 14th, August 2013. Look to the language, please. Look to the language which is now used here. Uh, the same statement by the EU representative, Kathleen Ashton. A great concern. And she said, advised people their confrontation after a massacre, uh, which took with it at least, at least 1,000 people. Their bodies were burned alive, shilling without, without, any, uh, without paying any attention to human rights and under the cameras of all of the world. I deplore the loss of lives. Okay, that's fine. Counseling conclusions on Egypt at that time. What the counseling conclusions? The EU condones the clear, in the clearest possible terms all acts of violence from where these acts of, of, of violence, from where? Who committed this uh, acts of violence? The EU believes the recent operations in, uh, of the Egyptian security forces have been disproportionate and have resulted in an unacceptable large number of deaths and injuries. Oh my God, oh my God. This is a reaction after a massacre, maybe the first, the first uh, massacre in its size, in its terrific maybe uh, uh, process. Uh, so, okay. So what's, what, what was the, the sanctions uh, uh, imposed? Suspended export licenses to Egypt of any equipment which might be used for international liberation. And the surprise, when I referred to the original to the former journal of the EU, I didn't, found, I didn't find these sanctions put in the official, official uh, journal, while sanctions of others in the world are put clearly in the official journal. So for the press release, they declared the suspension, the suspension of the uh, maybe the equipment which might be used for internal, internal uh, repressions. In the case of Tiananmen Square in 1989, and uh, I would like every one of, you, of us to
to uh, remind to remember what happened at that time the the maybe the maximum number given to the loss of lives the the, lo the, the loss of lives in in that time about 800 the maximum 800 to 1000 people uh, lost them, their lives uh, in, 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 in China at that time. The same, somehow the same, as, the, as what happened in Egypt. And what was the, the, the reaction of the EU at that time? Look, the European uh, Council strongly condemns the brutal repression taking place in China. It requests the Chinese authorities to stop the executions, okay? The, the repressive actions against those who legitimately clear their democratic rights. The Chinese authorities to respect human rights and take into account the hopes of freedom and democracy. And what, was, what were the sanctions imposed? Look to the sanctions. Raising the issue of human rights in China in the appropriate international forums. Asking for independent observers. This is <laughs> the first one. The second one, interruption by member states of the community of military cooperation, totally. Embargo on trade in arms, totally, until now, until now, from 1989, until now, these sanctions are applied. Suspicion of bilateral, ministerial, and high-level contacts, postponement by the community and its member states of new cooperation projects, reduction of programs of cultural, scientific, and technical cooperation why these sanctions apply in the case of china while do not apply in the case of of uh, of uh, egypt why the answer i don't want to to expand more uh, i have many things to talk about this issue but to answer this one so this question why just two minutes to answer this question uh, this question actually uh, is answered by what I'm termed as Blair's theory. Tony Blair's theory. You know what's about Tony Blair's theory? Anyone hear about this theory? Okay. This theory talks about this issue. Uh, I termed it Blair's theory. It's not a theory, but just uh, this is the website which you can find his talk about. Uh, about the issue in Egypt, in Egypt uh, the, mid, the Middle East matters, amongst other things, because in the Middle East, the future of Islam will be decided. Islamists are holding back the proper advanced political, social, and economic future. Fate of Egypt hangs the fate of the region. The battle, the battle is between the modernity and backwardness. Islamists are the same. They may differ in how to achieve the ultimate goals, but they do not differ about these goals. Muslim Brotherhood ideology, and try please to focus on this, Muslim Brotherhood ideology is built on combining between politics and Islam, which is, glo is, which is a global threatening matter. Member uh, Muslim Brotherhood ideology creates the soil, the soil in which such extremism can take its roots. Uh, so it is extremely wrong to distinguish between Muslim Brotherhood ideology and other extremist behaviors. Muslim Brotherhood are not simply bad government. They were systematically taking over the traditions and institutions of the country. So what happened in 30th of June was not an ordinary revolt. It was the absolutely, look please, and concentrate on this this sentence. It was the, the, the revolt of Sisi, the coup of Sisi. It was the absolutely necessary rescue of the nation. Look, this is the reaction of, of uh, the West should be standing steadfastly by its friends and allies in Jordan and the Gulf in their confrontation with forces taking the shape of Muslim Brotherhood and Iran. This is and we'll talk about this issue in the discussion if yeah. plenty of time available. I'm sorry for, for, for this. Uh, this uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just before we um, open the floor, I'd like to invite um, Marek Bilde and Professor Peter Mandeville, if they've got anything there to say, just to contribute to their. Okay. <laughs> 
thank, thank you for the opportunity to, to um, speak briefly. Um, since the panel is uh, framed in insights with respect to political Islam from Western policymakers, I, I wanted to give something of a, of a view from Washington, D.C. Uh, on some of these issues. Um, I, I'm, I'm an academic who uh, follows and has studied Islamist movements for many years. Um, uh, and also, during the time of the Arab uprisings, I was serving as an advisor in the State Department, uh, working specifically on the issue of, of how the U.S. government should, should think about uh, the um, uh, political Islam and the Muslim Brotherhood going forward. Um, so I, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government now. I'm simply an academic, but but I can reflect a little bit of how these issues are viewed. I think one common misconception is that in in the United States government there is something of an ideological opposition to um, I I Islamism, and people will often point to things like when in the mid-1990s the U.S. Embassy in Cairo stopped meeting with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the U.S. response to the 2006 electoral victory of Hamas um, uh, as, as examples of, of, of evidence of this ideological opposition. I think when you look at this issue in the context of broader U.S. Middle East policy, what reveals itself is the fact that U.S. orientation towards Islamist parties has primarily been a function of how the U.S. understands, correctly or incorrectly, we can and should uh, d debate, but really a function more of, um, uh, in my view, a misplaced understanding of U.S. security and strategic interests in the, the, the region. Right? When, when the U.S. cut off ties with the Ikhwan in 2005, this was not because Washington decided it didn't like Islamists and shouldn't talk to them anymore. This was because the Egyptian government specifically asked Washington, D.C. to stop speaking with the Muslim Brotherhood, which it had been, by the way, routinely since the late 1970s. This was a normal part of U.S. diplomatic engagement, to talk to the Muslim Brotherhood, which it saw as an important and influential force in Egyptian society. So really, the decision to stop, stop talking to the Ikhwan in 2005 tells you more about the U.S.-Egypt relationship than it tells you about how the United States views um, the, 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 the Ikhwan. In 2006, the, the reaction to the Hamas victory, again, was not uh, an ideological aversion to Islamism, although I would not doubt for a second that there are some in the Bush administration who did uh, have an ideological uh, uh, aversion to, 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 to political Islam. Rather, it was a function of the U.S.-Israel -Is relationship more than anything else, and also the fact that an entity that was on the U.S. State Department's list of terrorist organizations had been elected to power which then suddenly put in jeopardy millions of dollars of foreign aid and assistance that the United States and European governments had been uh, uh, give giving to the Palestinian <coughs> Authority. It created a major l l legal barrier. In, in 2011, when we had these dramatic developments and the popular uprisings and revolutions in Tunisia and uh, in, in Egypt, uh, the United States uh, government, I think, realized quite quickly that things were changing. Um, and in my experience, it, it wasn't very difficult to convince my colleagues in the government at the time that it was important for the United States to figure out how to engage with and to do business with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and Nahda uh, in, in Tunisia. The, 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 the challenge, I think, was, and I think this remains the challenge, there is, to some extent, this idea that Islamists are somehow exceptional or different from other kinds of political groups and so have to be handled and treated differently. Um, the policy the United States put in place at the time was one that sought to normalize the Brotherhood as a social and political actor, to regard and treat it as one among many different groups in Egypt that was becoming politically and socially influential in the aftermath of the ouster of Ho 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 Hosni Mubarak, which meant that there would be no test with respect to whether the United States was willing to talk to a group depending on what ideological flag it flew above it, but rather a recognition that all groups had to be engaged with. That doesn't mean that the United States necessarily agrees or disagrees with a particular group that it engages with, but rather a recognition that, that this kind of communication had to take place. The saddest part of this story, and it's it's a sadness that continues till today because it, it reflects the reality that we're in, is that 
in my view at least, United States policy towards Egypt has been completely consistent from the late 1970s up until, what are we, February 12th, 2015. As you all know, there was, in the aftermath of these revolutions, there were constantly rumors and conspiracy theories and questions about, you know, is the United States supporting the Brotherhood? Is the United States supporting the SCAF? Uh, are they playing both of them against each other? In my view, sitting in Washington, unfortunately, the explanation is much more straightforward and simple than that. The United States would support whatever group was in power that it perceived as supporting its own strategic interests. So when the SCAF was in power uh, and kept in line with U.S. expectations with regard to Camp David and with regard to counterterrorism cooperation and security cooperation, the U.S. said, that's fine, we're comfortable, and we don't need to say too much about democracy and human rights, although you could say things about democracy under the SCAF. When Mohamed Morsi was in power, the United States, after some initial hesitation, came to view him as someone they could do business with. The Israel peace treaty was preserved, core security cooperation continued, and I think Washington breathed, breathed a hot, huge sigh of relief and said, phew, we can regard this guy very much like we did the, the others. They are keeping to the uh, agreements, and so we'll, we'll work with him. There are things that could have been said about democracy and human rights under Mohammed Morsi that were not for these reasons. Under Sisi, obviously the same arrangement continues and intensifies even further. And obviously under Abdel Fattah Sisi, there is much that could be said about human rights and uh, democracy. So I think going forward, when trying to influence and talk to representatives of Western governments, and particularly my own country, simply pointing out inconsistencies between things that are said in speeches and statements and what is done in policy is not helpful. We know why these inconsistencies are there. It's because the country's calculation as to its interest in each of these different countries and settings is very different. So I think what we have to do is to make the case with respect to Egypt, say, and I'm, I've already spoken longer than I mean to, um, but if we want to try and have a different conversation with Washington, D.C. about Egypt, is to make the case that it is in the national security interest of the United States and in the national security interest of Egypt's government um, uh, for it to back off on its current op oppression of the Muslim Brotherhood and its growing authoritarian tendencies because these, this courses of policy by the Egyptian government will eventually lead to instability and increased uh, violence, which will threaten that own government as well as re regional st stability more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm a Danish diplomat who works out in Brussels and uh, uh, I'd just like to add to Peter's uh, description, which also covers uh, pretty much um, the European view. You have to bear in mind the EU is made out of 28 member states who do not necessarily always read events on the ground the same way. That uh, when we had the early elections in <coughs> Egypt, which did not appear on your, on your screen, um, the EU recognized and worked full speed with uh, Morsi and there are some who today say that we are not critical enough and that our policy more for more was actually more for Morsi. Um, what we need to bear in mind is that our policy is, and it has been consistent, is that we want to see inclusive government and there were, incre there were increasing worries, including on the Egyptian side, within Egypt, as to whether Morsi was doing the enough in that field. Now that can be debated, but that's why it's a little bit, I have a lot of respect for the work you've done, but I think it's a little bit simplistic to say that uh, there was no support for what happened inside, uh, inside Egypt. Now looking forward, you have to ask yourself, have we reached more inclusiveness in politics? If we haven't, how do we go about it? Do we reduce it to a problem with Europe having with Muslim Brotherhood? Or is this a question of something totally different? And that thing, when, if, when I saw the title, I was not going to focus so much on Egypt because I think it's a bit self-defeating. I think you need to look across the board. Also, don't talk in generic terms. Talk in the different parties, talk in the different countries so that you, you get the nuance. And that is 
continues to be our policy. We engage with the full spectrum of the political landscape. Um, sometimes uh, people don't like it. And when it gets too hot to do on the ground, we do it in Brussels. Um, I'm not Egyptess, but I have been working on political Islam for quite a number of years. And I can tell you that since uh, 2013, we have had a, a stream of visitors coming to Brussels to present precisely the views. And our doors remain open, our minds too. And we try to see how can we steer this to go towards something which is in, in everybody's interest, which is a truly stable uh, Egypt, a truly inclusive Egypt, whoever is at the bar. Now what is probably also worth saying is that we are an intergovernmental organization as such, we do like to work with governments. And that's why when gov people get elected to governments, it's a natural thing. But, and I'd like to refer you to that, Ashton did uh, come out with a very interesting piece on the Arab Awakening where she talks about the trust on both sides and how we need to build that. Um, and I think a little bit of honesty and, and humility in that endeavor is what we'll, we'll need to, to get beyond where we are today. Uh, very interesting uh, remarks from both of you. And, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I generally agree with, with what you've said, uh, because I think with regard to Egypt, the problem is not with Europe or America. The coup in Egypt was a United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia coup. Uh, I mean, we've lived, uh, um, I mean, those of us who came originally from somewhere else, we've, we've lived enough in the West to understand that foreign policy here is based <coughs> on interests. Mm. Uh, had Morsi remained in power, the Americans would have dealt with him and the Europeans would have dealt with him. And I remember uh, only a week before the coup, we were invited by the British government here to uh, brief us about uh, the upcoming visit of Mohamed Morsi. He was supposed to be here on the 11th of July uh, to have iftar with uh, Cameroon at 10 Downing Street. Uh, but uh, it was the Arab despotic uh, regimes in the region who were frightened of the Arab Spring and uh, they uh, invested uh, heaps of, uh, of, uh, of money uh, and uh, entered into all sorts of intrigues in order to make sure that democratization uh, is aborted, uh, not only in Egypt, but across the region. I mean, look what's happening uh, in, in, in Libya today, uh, w uh, what, happened, what has happened in Tunisia. Although, uh, thank God, it's not as uh, disastrous as uh, Syria and the other places. And look at what's happening in Yemen. This is all the work of regional interventions more than uh, international politics, mostly, uh, mostly regional. Uh, so, in, in other words, the, the ailments of the region uh, should be first addressed uh, without, of course, uh, uh, without uh, hesitation or reluctance from criticizing policy, whatever that policy happens to be uh, inconsistent with the values of the policymakers or the, the values that are claimed to be held by the, by the policymakers. Um, I think I've got very little to add. The only thing is I, I would say, um, and I don't think anyone would disagree with this, that you know, I, I think the whole question of the coup that overthrew Morsi is an incredibly complicated thing. And you mentioned you know, backing for it from, from Gulf monarchies, but I know from talking to Egyptian friends, there were an awful lot of Egyptians from very diverse backgrounds who supported it. I don't know... I'm not an Egyptian, I hesitate to say anything more, but I think, you know, we, we are seeing the history of an unfolding revolution, and like the French Revolution, you know, it didn't go on in a straightforward, in a straightforward course. Chile also, Chile, another important example. Well. Allende. <laughs> yes, maybe. I, I, know, I know less about Chile. I, I mean, but I did have Egyptian friends who were not your usual suspects. Yes. when it came to
when they who supported the, the quote coup, the army takeover. You know. Uh, indeed, uh, because I'm not a politician, <coughs> I have to build my debate and argument on uh, that analysis. <coughs> and after gathering, actually, from the EU, uh, the documents which I showed and which remained without showing, uh, these evidence uh, made sure that uh, the EU has been inconsistent when uh, it has dealt with uh, the uh, crisis in Egypt. And, and again, and I, I, I ask you, and maybe from the US as well, I think the Western reaction to what happened to the human rights and to the rule of law and to the democracy in Egypt would have not been the same if this happened from the Muslim Brotherhood side. And if those Muslim Brotherhood who was, uh, who committed these massacres, I think, and I think that you agree with me, I think the reaction will be, or would be, have been maybe more uh, severe. I think. So, just a minute, please. Uh, if, 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 so, <coughs> to conclude my, my argument, I think that the EU uh, has been realistically driven. And so it is very inconsistent when dealt with the Egyptian coup. The EU involved, in, unfortunately, it is academic, maybe proven, in legitimizing and legalizing the military coup in Egypt from the first beginning. And I have many evidence. If anyone interested actually in the evidence, I have many evidence about this issue. Many evidence from the beginning. From the beginning. The EU differentiates between blood and blood upon its background and identity of the perpetrators. So if the massacres come from China because it is a fool, it is a rival, so it is very strong in its reaction. When the perpetrators of massacres are Western agents, and put please two lines under this talk, when they are Western agents, Israel, secular uh, parties in the Arab world, the, the corrupted regime, the, uh, the EU condones them. While if they are of its rivals or foes like Russia now, foes or rivals, it significantly sharpens its knives. So every day, in 25th of January this year, 30 people killed in the fourth anniversary of the revolution in Egypt. 30 people. 30 people. At the same day, at the same day, uh, 30 people <coughs> killed in Eastern Ukraine. The European Union and uh, uh, they immediately called for an emergency foreign affairs council. And they took actions. They put bodies from Russia and Ukraine, yeah, with the uh, separatists, on the sanctions list after 30 people killed in Ukraine. The same 30 people figure killed in Egypt. No reaction. No reaction. No emergency meeting. And Sisi is kept supported for the democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt. Thank you. John's got just, one final just, just very, very up. briefly. I, I think you have, you have put your finger on something very important. I think we cannot get away with, from the fact that there is, an, shall we say, an element of Western hypocrisy. We may disagree over the degree of it, but there is an element. And another factor that I think should be factored into this is the whole view of the Arab world and of Islam in Western countries. Um, it is something, in democratic countries, people respond to the electorates inevitably. And that I think does make it harder sometimes for democratically elected governments to act in the way they know they ought to when it comes to the Middle East. Thank Just you. throw that in.
Okay, well, I'd just like to thank our panel very much for um, coming here and giving us their thoughts today. That was really enlightening and, and really quite interesting. Um, thank you all to coming for coming.